This is Jerry Ditter, and this is the history of Jerry Part 1, the five-time world champion of the 10 Winers Rotisserie Baseball League, owner slash manager of the Diddley Squats. This is a selection of slides of uh, artwork I've done since the 1970s. And the first one we see here is Jesus Christ, or Shirley Temple Superstar. Uh, the movie Jesus Christ Superstar was probably out at that time, and so I did my own version of it, but with Shirley Temple. And uh, there she is on the cross, and then down below there's her manager and his secretary and all kinds of people fainting and collapsing. And then um, uh, this was probably done in the 74, 1974, something like that. And next. And this is Gordy Elephant, the first elephant to score 500 goals in the NHL. And here he is playing against the Leafs, scoring a goal and smacking a few Toronto Maple Leafs around, which is always a good thing. And that. And it is uh, just, you know, I did a whole series of elephants, and this is just one of them. Next. Uh, oh, this is uh, the highway in the sky, I think this was called. And I just threw a cylinder, and uh, you know, the cylinder is probably about 22 inches tall, plus the uh, cloud in the garage up on top. And the cars are done in relief and a goofy relief, and uh, uh, a, a fun little piece. Again, the mid 70s. Oh, this is a Caesar salad. Uh, I did a series of salads, and this is the canned Caesar salad, and then. Uh, uh, on the outside, it was done on a uh, takeoff on black figured pottery, even though the figures are red. And that, and I did it like it would be done as a soup can, in that on the back of it, it has the ingredients and instructions in both French and English. And when you look into the bowl, there is the Colosseum, and there is the uh, a guy on a chari chariot with a, a damsel in distress riding his chariot down in there. And, there, and then it has this uh, tin can lid on it that's been opened. And on the uh, outside of the tin can lid, it had a, I think it said two for 79 or something like that. And some little kid was in there with his dad and he asked his dad, is uh, where's the other one so we can buy both and that but it was already sold uh, really quite a neat little piece next oh, just another view looking down into the uh, Caesar salad oh this is streaker salad streakers were really popular at this time so I had all kinds of uh, veggies put into it put into this uh, bowl and that and then there was all these streakers running around so like there is in the bottom left there was green onion forest so you just take your green onions turn them upside down and they would run through the forest and uh, each of the areas would be a bowl would be named after that and this bowl is only about 12 13 inches across and so it's not big so everything is uh, all the figures are pretty small Next, uh, this is a lemon pie. Uh, did a series of lemon pies, and uh, there is uh, actually, you know, did the thing where um, you put the meringue on, but I stuck lemons actually into it. And this was done, done in a pie plate, and then on the glaze, the white is called a snow glaze, and then I just took a transparent brown glaze and just put it on top of it to give it that nice, uh, that nice uh, you know, lemon pie look. Oh, sinking of the Titanic pie. I didn't limit myself to fruit pies. This is, a, of course, this is the sinking of the Titanic, always a popular uh, <laughs> theme to use for when you're do, doing goofy ceramics. And, uh, and, you know, it's just, again, another pie plate uh, size and, uh, and, you know, again, part of the series. Oh, when I was in, uh, I uh, 
basically, I graduated in 76, worked for three years. In 1979, I moved to Regina, and I actually started painting and quit doing ceramics. This guy here is one of four trophies that I did while I was in Yorkton, and I think that was 19... Uh, 1991 or 1990, I think it was 1990, and they asked me to do these four trophies for the uh, high schools for various things. And so uh, I had to do one with, you know, how teenagers and outgrow one part of their body faster than another. So this is a Bigfoot trophy. Oh, and this is another trophy, and it's just a cone head. Uh, eating a hot dog and uh, having some fries and a Coke. Oh, uh, this is from my very first exhibition, kind of a yellow slide. This is from my first ex exhibition. It came off of a book called Very Special People about uh, sideshow freaks. Uh, very politically incorrect to do this kind of stuff today, but I was pretty politically incorrect in my <laughs> most of my life. And that. this is Bowen and Tripp. One guy was missing his arms and one guy was missing his legs. And they would come out on a tandem bicycle with one guy uh, pedaling and the other guy steering. And then just a backdrop that I made from... Uh, I had looked at quite a few of these um, um, pictures of the uh, advertising that they had for the freak shows. And uh, that next... And this is just uh, the, you know, the giants that they have at the, uh, at the, uh, what do you call it? The show is both of the, go ahead, uh, financial and uh, uh, basically critical failure, except for amongst artists. Artists liked it, but hardly anybody else did. And that, oh, and this is one of my favorite one of the series. Actually, originally I intended to do the series to do a painting of a large painting of the Elephant Man, which I never had time to do. But this is the Mule Woman, and uh, <coughs> like I like to refer to her as my girlfriend, and it's Grace McDaniel's, and uh, uh, I had to put a couple of mules in there, and you know, backdrops and things like that are just things I made up. Oh, and this is. Uh, this is my former dining room table. The oval shape is uh, from my uh, half of my old dining room and on put on a piece of 4x4 four four plywood. And it's called Bugatti's at Pikes Peak. And uh, this is uh, Pikes, Peaks is, uh, Pikes Peak is a famous road race in uh, the United States somewhere. And, uh, and that, this is them racing uh, up the mountain. And Bugatti's are just a favorite old antique car that I loved and it is uh, the clouds are made out of foam covered with plaster and then painted and this was in uh, an exhibition um, the Saskatchewan Open I think it was called and you were invited uh, artists from all over were invited to send slides in of their work to be chosen to be in an exhibition there and it was uh, uh, I got into it, and that, and then to top it off, I actually got one of the purchase awards. So I got paid seven hundred and fifty dollars for this, and at that time, uh, most I'd ever gotten for a ceramic piece was about seventy-five or eighty dollars. And so I knew painting was for me at this moment because I could make a lot more money than I did with ceramics. Uh, this is from a series of paintings I did about my trip to India and uh, in 1972, 73. Uh, this is Bandi Amir in central Afghanistan. It's a series of five um, sunken lakes. It's in the middle of desert and each lake is a little deeper down. They're naturally fed, so they're pure, uh, they're white with streaks of different minerals in it. But there is no real color, so it only reflects the color of the sky that day. So if it's a gray sky, they're gray. Now I painted the ba uh, the uh, hills and everything as a desert to begin with, but that just didn't work. And uh, so I decided this is, uh, I've always liked hot rods and that, and this is uh, like uh, what's called tuck and roll upholstery. 
So this is my tuck and roll uh, landscape with ba uh, the, ba the lakes at Bandy Amir. And at the bottom is the only building that had been finished and it was a little mosque at the very bottom by the, uh, one of the lakes. And uh, we stayed in a place where the only, there was like probably about a dozen of us and uh, you slept on the floor in the carpets, on carpets. There, were, there weren't, wasn't a hotel or anything else like that. And this was pretty primitive, uh, probably, and there was nothing there. There were the five lakes. Okay, next, uh, this is the Khyber Pass, and it really looks like this. <laughs> These were my fudgical mountains. And you actually are going through uh, mountains. This is going in between uh, when you're leaving Afghanistan and going into Pakistan. You can actually see the, the fortress. Uh, and it actually has it painted in big white letters, uh, the Khyber Rifles. Uh, and uh, I was really, uh, you know, having a lot of fun. These are all uh, about six feet by four feet. They're uh, on plywood. And uh, uh, really nothing much else I can add to this one. Uh, this is uh, called uh, Trip to Kashmir, I think it is. And uh, Kashmir is in northern India. And uh, this is just the different sites that you would see as you're going through the m mountains. And when you're going up there, like you're going over army bridges because of uh, landslides have taken away the road. Uh, you're going over landslides uh, before you get there. And it's, it's two eight hour trips on a bus from um, uh, Pesh, no, um, uh, Amritsar. And so you go to Jammu first and then you go to Srinagar, which is on Lake Dahl, which is gorgeous. And so, each one is a different view of things as you're going up there. At the top has got a picture of one of the mosques on top of a hill that is in, in Kashmir. We lived on a houseboat in this place on Lake Dahl. Uh, this is an example of when I did a painting, put it in a show, it didn't sell. I knew it didn't work when I put it in there, but it was a big rush getting it in there. So I thought, what can I do to improve this painting? So I have no qualms of painting over one of my own paintings to, you know, make it better. And so I added all this foliage and everything came afterwards. I put it up for a month or two in the gallery and then I took it back and then spent some time doing all this uh, foliage so that it looks like you're going through the jungle and coming out to look at these um, Mayan, Inca, whatever, you know, some kind of ancient culture. And oh, holler, six feet by eight feet. That's how big this thing is. And it took me six weeks to paint this thing, full work painting full time. Inspiration came from a National Geographic uh, 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 picture and that, and uh, you know, just made up a bunch of foliage and that stuff like that. And uh, in front of this big palm frond with a howler monkey there. Uh, I remember when, I think it was the Divine Government was in power, this sat, and this was up on the wall in the Executive Council Chamber for years. And it's also been displayed at the uh, Art Gallery of Regina, it used to be called the Rosemont, on three of the four walls somehow, <laughs> I don't know how. It's owned by the Saskatchewan Arts Board and it usually goes out to different places. This is just, uh, this I think, this is a, the uh, uh, winter version. The snow has hit the, uh, uh, some, you know, wherever this monkey lives, uh, which I think is in South America, and uh, the snow has hit, and so this is just a snowy version of it. Uh, trekking to Everest. Again, another big painting, six feet by eight feet. Uh, because, and that, and... Uh, um, you know, to move these around is quite the struggle and that. And uh, I had been experimenting with these transparencies that was I was doing uh, with rollers, paint rollers, and, uh, and that. And uh, it was owned by Steve Arsenich, and he had it at his law firm. And I don't know what happened to it after that, but uh, um, 
I call these ones like a decorating decorator painting because it goes with any furniture and that uh just uh, uh, these would be for, this would be from a group show where I wasn't working on a theme but I had read an article about uh, Pueblos and things like that and so I just decided to do a snowy scene. I actually love doing snowy scenes. Must be the idea I come from Saskatchewan. Another decorator painting and that. And this is pandas in a forest in the winter. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen a panda in the snow, but they seem to really enjoy it. They love rolling around in it. They love sli sliding down it. This would have been in the Christmas shows, one of the Christmas shows at the Susan Whitney Gallery. And uh, I found that these monochromatic paintings, again, called decorator paintings in my book. Uh, some people get offended by that, but... Uh, People like these paintings, and I would do them. Uh, I did the, tried to do them almost every Christmas show. This was Sassport had decided to do. I don't know exactly what it was for, but Sassport commissioned uh, a bunch of artists to do different works. I hardly ever do figures, but this was after the Calgary Olympics, and this is a, uh, a of course, a ski jumper in the Canadian outfits. This was the first time I ever noticed that the fashion of the Olympics, like all the different uh, outfits that they would wear from the different teams, and I thought it was great. And this one here uh, is one of the few figurative paintings I've ever done. And you'll notice there is no face, because I can't do them. So <laughs> this is this 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 is the uh, sinking of the Titanic bathtub racer. <laughs> One year at the um, summer, you know, July 1st uh, festival at uh, Wascana Lake, uh, they decided to have the most creative uh, bathtub competition and that. And I was working at uh, doing some renovation work at somebody's house and listening to radio and this came on. And I'd gone to the hardware store to pick up some materials and I ran into two friends of mine, Dick Spafford and David Thalberger, and I was telling them about it because within about 15 seconds of them mentioning this thing, this competition, I thought immediately sinking the Titanic. As I've said before, Titanic is a good uh, favorite one. So we found this old galvanized bathtub and uh, like all of the... Uh, the, the the decks of the ship and the iceberg in front and everything is all made out of foam and then painted and that and then the uniform is actually a real Canadian Navy uniform from a friend of ours who was a pilot for the Canadian Navy and he let me his cap and I was at this thing and I uh, I had my crew who had put this thing together because it all fit in the back of a Datsun that's a station wagon from the 1970s. And I had my crew put it together. And while I went put it to put it together, I would walk around saluting people and they'd be taking pictures of me. Oh, I also uh, turned my uh, beard into mutton chops. So I, I uh, would look really English too. And, that, and the fun thing was is that on the uh, iceberg, what we did is that we... Uh, after we painted it, uh, we put sparkle on it, so it just looked like snow. And then the final thing we did is uh, Dick went out and got some dry ice. And so we had brought jugs of water and things like that. He poured the dry, uh, we poured the dry ice, and this was still on land, over top of the iceberg and then threw water on it. And so this fog enveloped the whole thing and the crowd went nuts. I had to prove to them I could still go in the water and actually, you know, paddle a thing, but I didn't have to race. And I had already won the big prize anyways. And I was able to do it because we took it on a test run in Wascana Lake. And uh, we had uh, uh, strategically pieces of foam put on this thing so that it would float. And this little uh, iceberg, it actually ended up being right on the water line. So it actually looked like it was part of it. And uh, 
love to do fun projects like this. They hardly ever come up. Oh, the tea leaf pickers. Um, just saw pictures of the tea leaf. This is a little dark, this slide, because I was a lousy photographer. And, uh, and it's just the way of, uh, you know, these patterns and uh, kind of an abstraction going on there, too. And uh, I, I'm still being influenced big by Roger Brown, I would say. There's Mount Fuji in the background with a harvest moon. And uh, uh, again, a little dark, which is too bad because this thing is quite bright. Oh, um, I can't remember if this is a takeoff on the Hokusai or Hiroshogi. I never remember, but it's from the views of uh, Mount Fuji. And this is the Great Wave, my version of the Great Wave. And I basically painted this for myself because I did it, I put it into a summer group show and, uh, and that, and uh, I only put it in for a month or two and I wanted to take it home and put it up on my wall. And it still sits there, all dusty and covered in smoke stained and all that, but I still like it. Uh, just a Japanese garden paintings because I've done a couple of shows of Japanese gardens and I, I just love how they, you know, they use different aspects of, uh, of you know, gardening and that. This is a sand garden with a little pagoda in it and, uh, and a straight cut he uh, hedge, which was unusual. And the uh, city of Regina owns this. And it is, uh, last time I saw it, it was in the meeting room over at the Art Gallery of Regina. Again, just a Japanese painting of a, uh, this is actually probably Chinese, uh, because those kind of bridges were common. And I don't know, you, had, you climb steps to get up and down these uh, half moon uh, uh, bridges and that. And uh, uh, something that would just be taking different elements from different pictures and then putting them together. A uh, Japanese garden, a uh, courtyard garden uh, with bamboo and uh, sand that has not been moved and just a paper, um, uh, Japanese paper screens. Again, courtyard garden with a bamboo walkway all the way around it and a small uh, rock that has a bowl shape for, with water in it. Oh, this is bonsai bonsai, and this is, uh, again, these are almost all large, by the way, that we're talking about. This is about four foot by four foot, and uh, that probably 44 by 44, because I found out that it's easier to make a crate for a 44 by 44 inch painting than it is by a 48 by 48. And what it is, is it's just a, um, a bunch of steps or shelves, and they're covered in different uh, bonsai plants. It's, it was over 40 different plants that I put on this thing. And after a while, I was just making up whatever plant I wanted. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a temple, a, a, a Japanese temple being reflected in a pool, a pond in the winter where it's not that cold out, but uh, this is the uh, a gray version of it. and. Uh, Probably, again, something I put in for the Christmas show, or could have been for um, one of the Japanese garden paintings, but I'm thinking it was actually for a Christmas show. Uh, oh, I um, can't remember. Uh, tiger, I think this is called Tiger Tiger. And uh, this is just a bamboo uh, with uh, shadows of the bamboo leaves on it and the tiger hiding in the background. Uh, love bamboo. I have a book by a Japanese photographer who spent his entire life uh, recording bamboo. Again, another piece of bamboo, but this time just a real close up with water droplets on it. And that. Oh, family portrait. This is my family as goldfish. Another big painting, you know, six feet by eight feet, something like that. Uh, and. Uh, that's my, uh, from the left, that's my mom, my dad, my sister, my brother up there, and then me at the bottom. And uh, um, somebody bought it and actually put it in their dining room, which almost covered the whole wall. Oh, this is from the, I did a couple of shows of just fish, and uh, 
I'm trying to remember the name of this one. It's a lionfish. I know that. And uh, I just, I, I just think this, you have a gorgeous fish. So it's not hard to make a nice painting when you got a gorgeous fish. And these are highly aggressive. So this is one mean bugger that's looking at you thinking, how can I eat you? And uh, this is called Ying and Yang, and it is two different, um, uh, two uh, Siamese fighting fish. And of course, the Ying and Yang is like from the center, it's self explanatory. And that, and then the bubbles are uh, uh, there are for a um, are for eggs, and to make all those bubbles, I didn't want to try to paint that many circles because geez, I would I would have, I'd be still painting it today if I had to paint those by hand. But I had a series of bottle caps, so I would just dip bottle caps into white paint, and then just started putting them on there, and uh, and then afterwards, you know, uh, just filling in the empty spots and uh, uh, really, uh, you know, got to figure out how to make transparencies better in this painting. And then this is a, just again, fish paintings, and this is puffer fish. You can't see it in this slide, but in the lower left-hand corner, there's a moray eel that scared them, and that's why they puffed up, and then they, I put these spikes on them. I'm not sure if puffer fish do have spikes or not. And then with the sun rays coming in. And a lot of people think these things are airbrushed. And they're not. Uh, they are just done with uh, foam brushes. Uh, either the foam brush uh, that, you know, like rollers, or just the uh, flat uh, rectangular foam brushes. And, uh, and then uh, putting transparent blues to sort of make it more unified. So there's no airbrushing done. Only one painting did I ever use an airbrush on and we haven't seen it. Uh, just fish, again, uh, in a cave or, you know, something like that. And uh, uh, just uh, one of the fish that schools. And so uh, this is just a made up thing. Uh, again, uh, this is like an eel of some kind going out there to eat some poor fish because that's the kind of guys they are. And just the beauty of coral and all the different colors and shapes that it comes in. This I wanted to do where I had a, just a deep, empty space. And uh, this kind of uh, coral, uh, I think it's called plate coral, with just, just these, uh, I think these are tangs, uh, the fish below. And, uh, and that um, somebody, uh, a collector who has bought a lot of my stuff, uh, actually uh, has this up in the radiology department at Pasqua Hospital. These are the Stooges. Uh, they're just albino um, uh, dugons uh, or manatees. And I wanted to try to have this kind of a background where it was uh, like something out of the cartoons or something like that. Never been satisfied with this painting because the tails were just, I couldn't get them to work. And which is why you see that little one, you don't see his tail at all. And that, and, uh, and that's about it for this one. Uh, octopus painting, and uh, uh, there's actually a little blue octopus uh, sitting on the left-hand center. And uh, again, nice corals and that. And uh, uh, really actually kept on learning a lot about painting and the technical aspects of painting when I was doing this one because doing all those suckers took quite a while, but uh, I managed to figure out how to, you know, be fairly quick with them. The shadowing is done just with a um, kind of a reddish glaze uh, that they, um, they would have been calling it a glaze back in the oil paint days. I don't know what they call it today. Uh, Justin Manta Ray uh, gave this to some friends of mine uh, just because, uh, hey, who doesn't like a manta ray? Oh, and these, um, this is just a painting of uh, zebras and uh, Mount Kilimanjaro in the background. And uh, just, uh, and that's about it, just the uh, uh, African painting. Oh, this one is upside down because this is a reflection painting, so the water's sitting up there. And, uh, but this is upside down and uh, 
I know that when I went into schools to talk to them about uh, painting, uh, I used to talk to them about how you could do a paper cutout, uh, fold over a piece of paper, cut out your landscape that you're going to be putting in there, and then, uh, and then, you know, and that will do your uh, other side. Paint both sides with the same color and then put a transparent blue to darken one's, the water part and add a few wave lines in that. And as far as the palm trees go, there's no way in the world you can look at both sides at once and figure out, oh, is that an exact image? And uh, I always tell people to think that way. Uh, just a jaguar in uh, in a forest. This would have been, you know, a, a one for a group show. And uh, this is a smiling, he, this is a happy jag. He probably just ate. Oh, waiting for Lawrence. Uh, this is a painting from um, uh, a Lawrence of Arabia. Um, I think it's a David Lean movie, isn't it? I think it is. And this is a scene from it which I always loved, and it was just. Lawrence was Lawrence was out in the in the desert, trying to save uh, this guy's buddy, and uh, and he just sat there on his camel, and just waited for him, and so uh, I just call it waiting for Lawrence. Touring toucans, they've taken a little trip and found this place. This is a smaller painting, but always love toucans. Can't can't avoid those beautiful beaks. And this is uh, Japanese cranes. Uh, forgot the name of this one. This sits in my living room. It's about five feet by five feet. And it's uh, just Japanese cranes dancing in a, um, in a Japanese garden. Uh, this is, I don't remember the title of this one. It's just a peacock. This again is dark. This is a lot brighter than it looks but with a Taj Mahal in the background because I was at the Taj Mahal and they do have peacocks around it. Uh, just another African painting with a variety of wildlife in it. I love doing these kind of paintings because you can just do whatever you want as far as, you know, you try to make the wildlife look as real as possible, but there's so, element, so many elements of the African landscape that uh, just, you know, it's just appealing to most people. Uh, just uh, uh, two uh, polar bears, uh, they're actually eating uh, some kind of uh, vegetation where you see a little bit of red blood there in the bottom. Again, this is a dark slide and that. And uh, actually the woman who owns this, she got it from the, uh, when uh, Chris Bosch's, who uh, uh, was a collector who died of cancer, his wife was moving to Calgary and couldn't take all their art and sold this to this lady. And she phoned me up one day and she said, well, you know, what can I do with it or will you buy it back? And I says, well, no, I don't buy paintings back besides I don't have any place to put it. So I told her, well, you know, use it as a feature wall instead of like, you know, putting wallpaper or some tacky wood boards or whatever, orange shag carpet. Put the painting up and have that as your feature wall because it's about 60 inches by 60 inches. Uh, get out of my face. Uh, this painting is, well, it's a charging elephant and it's called Get Out of My Face. And uh, uh, great fun doing this painting. Uh, the elephant hardly took me any time at all. The tusks took forever to get right, or as far as I was concerned, as far as I was to go. And uh, it's just a charging elephant. And uh, this is again, you know, uh, by this time I'm not making six foot by eight foot paintings because they're so hard to handle. So this one would be in the range of seven feet by 60 inches, which turns out to be my arm span, so I can hold on to it. And this is, been on the covers of books and, uh, and in magazines, and uh, it was quite a popular one. And, well, why not make a buffalo while you're at it? And that's what I did, is I made a buffalo one. Again, a dark slide, because actually buffalo does look more buffalo. Here he looks a little dark. Leading the stampede. Uh, this is a small one. I played, at the time I was playing a lot of golf. This is a hole at a golf course outside of Victoria. 
and uh, this is what it actually looked like. Here you're going downhill, uh, and um, you, there's the uh, T uh, with uh, or the green with the sand uh, traps and everything like that, and this waterfall behind it. It was unbelievable to go onto the uh, T box of this hole and look down and see a waterfall behind the green. It was gorgeous. Best golf course I ever played. Uh, uh, the popular thing amongst uh, with golfers is make up your own golf course. So this is a make up. This is an African golf course which I made up. There's little tee boxes on the right and the green is down on the left. Uh, another golf painting. Uh, these last two are in my place. I guess they weren't that popular. Uh, anyways, just a island, uh, a green that's not an island, but a, an isthmus. And uh, the three di di different uh, tee boxes there and going over water because God knows I put enough golf balls into water in my lifetime that uh, I could fill an Olympic-sized pool. And, oh, this is another... A green in the middle of a jungle. <laughs> Only t thing that tells you that is the uh, flag. And that, as you say about paintings like this, you can always tell when you've hit hardwood or softwood because hardwood it sounds a lot harder than softwood. Now this is a painting I couldn't even remember when I was going through the slides. I couldn't even remember doing. I don't have any idea. I don't think it's a very big painting. Probably should have been, and that, but uh, you know, just something made up and based on some other picture I saw. But it just turns out that this is it could be a golf painting. Are those golf balls down there? There's two white spots, maybe it's a golf painting. Oh, that could be a green back there. Yes, I think this is a golf painting. Wow, anyways, I couldn't remember doing this one, but I sure like it. I wish I could, could have kept that one. Oh, and of course, golfing in the fall, even though these stupid trees, these must be larches that have turned uh, yellow in the fall and are going to uh, lose their leaves. And that's it for that one. Uh, oh, can't go without having something with palm trees, too. An island green and... Uh, uh, that's again that's about all i can say about that one and that uh, and this one is just a japanese garden i don't think there's any golf involved in this one and uh you wouldn't oh it is it's a sand trap done there's a little golf ball in the upper center between those two little islands there's a golf ball that's gone into there I'm, I'm pretty sure the groundskeeper would be pretty P.O.'d at the person that put the ball into their Japanese garden. Uh, one of the uh, fundraising projects for the McKenzie Gallery when they were moving into the new place is they wanted, uh, uh, they wanted people to take clay pots and then do something with them. So this is what I did. It is the uh, proverbial island green uh, surrounded by uh, trees and uh, again I just use foam I used the foam a lot in some of the sculptural things and uh, styrofoam and uh, made an insert and that and then there was a little lake uh, in there as well I think the next slide might show it and on the outside it's got the black figure pottery as the golfers taking a swing yep there it is yep uh, uh, and that uh, at the very bottom of the uh, thing is the tea box, and then there's a little lake and sand traps and uh, surrounded by trees and the green. I'd probably put about six balls into that little pool there. Uh, just saw some pictures of a very, you know, maritime thing with uh, boats in a uh, very still waters. So this would, you know, the three different boats aren't the same place. It's not from one scene. It's just a whole, three different boats that I liked and put into a nice little thing. Again, a very large painting, probably seven feet tall. Ah, the Rainbow Sentinels, the first one. Uh, I think I'm going to have a break. Okay.
Yeah. I'm going to have a smoke. All right, let's stop. Yeah. Uh, this is the start of the Rainbow uh, Sentinel series, as in elevators. So um, they're called Prairie Sentinels by a lot of people, the old style elevators, which are quickly disappearing. Uh, for Expo 86 in Vancouver, they asked me and David Thalberger to do uh, prairie themed paintings, uh, which I had never done before uh, for uh, the Expo 86. And they were going to pick one that was going to be enlarged and put on the outside of uh, the uh, Sask Saskatchewan Pavilion. And so this was my version of it. I actually always thought it'd be great to do a, uh, a what do you call it, a rainbow-colored elevator. And I know the one I'd want. It's outside of North Balford. You get a great view of it coming in from Saskatoon on the highway. And it would be the perfect one because you get lots of traffic, blah, blah, blah. I thought it would be perfect. Now, a lot of people have thought this has got some connection with the gay community. And according to what I've been told, the gay community has sort of hijacked this image for their website. It has nothing to do with that kind of thing. It was about the fact that each elevator company had their own colors. I think Cargill is orange. Uh, there's other ones that, that the blue they paint their elevator. Sask Wheat Pool was the famous red the barn red kind of uh, a color and that. And uh, I didn't want to be an, doing an advertisement for a, a grain company also, so I thought, well, do all the colors, and that way n no grain company could sit there and say, well, this is us and that. And this was the first one, and when I was doing the Sentinels, I was only using, uh, in the beginning, I was only doing these for charitable events or you know special events or commissions or whatever not commissions um competitions uh, never did it as a commission and uh, maybe i do one a year or something like that and that was the start of the sentinels uh, this is a snowstorm in saskatchewan and uh, it's a big one we've got the drifts going right over top of the uh, each of the elevators here. And it is, uh, you know, taking the Great Wave by um, Hokusai or Hiroshogi. I can't remember which one. But using the idea of the Great Wave and putting it onto uh, uh, the Sentinels. This was a whole show of Rainbow Sentinels. And I wanted to call a show Dumber Than Donuts because it was all going to be dumb ideas like this one. And that... But my dealer thought, oh, no, I don't like that, and blah, blah, blah. And so she decided to call it New Paintings. <laughs> okay, next. And for the entrepreneurship, what happens is the farmers decided to take these snowdrifts that are over top of the uh, uh, sentinels and turning them into ski hills. So here's a night vision of the ski hills with the lights on. And uh, and uh, that and this was I considered this a diptych, but it was sold to two. They were sold to two different people. Uh, I was out on a um, um, educational tour of schools with Ken from the uh, Mackenzie Gallery, and uh, we came up to um, like a turnoff that went up to um, well, where was it up to? Uh, where the potash mine is, uh, Rokenville and places like that. And here was a billboard, a small sign in somebody's farm saying ostrich farm. So the two of us started talking about well, how do uh, ostriches uh, dress in the winter for here. So here they are with little tubes and uh, uh, leg warmers, rainbow leg warmers and rainbow... Uh, neck warmers and there's even one with his head in the snow and rainbow elevators in the background another gr dumb idea and uh, this is the uh, space shuttle um, rainbow sentinel from the saskatchewan aeronautical and space agency and this is that liftoff 
and that. At, when I first did this painting, I wasn't totally satisfied with it, but it's grown on me because I have it up on the wall in my house and I uh, recently, and uh, uh, I've gotten to quite like it. And here is the space shuttle, uh, Rainbow Sentinel, putting out Shifa lights to feed the world. They send down rays that grow food onto the planet. And uh, this is only a small painting. Should have done it as a big painting because, again, another goofy idea that I really liked a lot. This was a fun show to do. And that. Oh, and I got tr in trouble with this painting. Uh, after the um, uh, the war, whichever war, God only knows there's so many of them, uh, they, uh, in Iraq where the, uh, um, what do you call it, the uh, oil wells were set on fire. And they had these uh, fantastic images of the wind blowing the smoke uh, all in the same direction from all these oil wells. So I substituted all these rainbow sentinels being on fire and the, and the uh, what do you call I think the story was is that what would happen if you had a small agricultural uh, community invaded the United States and uh, this they, they seeked revenge upon you and this is what they did they sent your uh, your grain elevators on fire and why did you get in trouble? Oh, it was at the, uh, it ended up, the University of Saskatchewan bought it, and it ended up at the School of Agriculture. And people would come in there, and they thought this was like some slam on agriculture and the farm community. And it had nothing to do with that. So this guy phones me up that sort of runs a collection for them, and he's telling me about all these people complaining about this painting. And I tell him the story. He says, well, I tell you what, I wrote up something about it. And I want to know if it's okay if I put up a, you know, a, a plaque with this, the, my explanation of what this painting is about to try to calm people's uh, emotions down about this. And so he read it out to me and I says, eh, sure, go ahead. You guys bought the painting. You get to do whatever you want with it. You can probably tell those farmers they can take it out in the back and burn it if you want. You can include that. Oh, uh, the city of Regina owns this one. And so instead of, uh, uh, you know, now they're having the inline grain terminals that are killing the uh, small elevators. There's a small elevator in the distance on the right-hand side. And terminal is both for what these are called. This is based on the one outside of Saskatoon. Uh, and uh, uh, and it's called, terminal is both death of uh, the elevators and terminal for what they're replacing it with. And the city of Regina bought it and I bet you anything, wherever they put it, the people hate it. Okay, the crop circles. This painting is called Proof because it's an image, so it can't lie. So this is really how it works. In the another dimension, there are rainbow elevators mounted on giant springs, and they they hop around on the on the prairies, putting in these uh, uh, crop circles. So this is proof for anybody who had any doubts about how they were made. It wasn't aliens. It wasn't. Uh, uh, college students having a good time or anything else. This is how it was done. Next. Uh, one year, uh, the, the, a lot of these Rainbow Sentinel paintings had to deal with what was going on in the prairie, in the, uh, in the farm economy, the agri agricultural economy in Saskatchewan. This was done on, based on the painting of one year uh, where it was just flooding everywhere. So, like, you know, I had to have the uh, elevators in there and, you know, one is so badly flooded, it's actually leaning over. Uh, the leaning uh, uh, Rainbow Sentinel of Saskatchewan there with the telephone lines. And, uh, and, and I, used, I started using um, the farm economy as a metaphor for a lot of these paintings later on. Uh, but, you know, not everything serious for a Rainbow Sentinel. This is a Rainbow Sentinel bungee jumping off a bridge uh, into a sea of wheat. And that's uh, 
just as recreational activities for bungee jump for uh, rainbow sentinels. Uh, as far as the metaphor goes, this is the one where the farm economy was bit, being hit by everything. Uh, high interest rates, low farm prices, uh, the banks foreclosing, and each shark fin would represent a different thing that was attacking the economy. And it's sort of like this idea that it's shrinking and shrinking and turned into this island with many elevators uh, fighting off the sharks. And that, oh, like I said, uh, the, elevator, the, the sentinels love to have some recreational time. So they go to the beach. They go for their Mexican holidays. And here they are sitting, you know, sitting on the beach enjoying the view. This actually went to my boss in Yorkton. Uh, she, you know, uh, for my artist in residence position and that, and she liked the Rainbow Sentinel paintings. And uh, I thought, oh, I'll, it's a smaller one. And I did this for her as a gift. So Final words. That, that, that's all, folks. That's it.